At a recent meeting in Vancouver, British Columbia, eminent American cardiologist Dr. William C. Roberts, recipient of the James F. Mitchell Foundation Award in 1987 for outstanding work in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, addressed an interested and enthusiastic audience on the subject of life, lipids, and longevity. May and Baker, a division of Roan Poulenc Pharma Inc., is pleased to bring you some of the highlights of his presentation. Let's join Dr. Victor Huckle as he introduces Dr. Roberts. He's currently editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Cardiology. He has made innumerable book reviews, medical audiovisuals, and he actually made one today on this trip. He has 791 publications. He's presented and discussed 206 abstracts. And prior to my summarizing his CV, he had made 824 presentations around the world. This is his 825th presentation. Uh, he's presently chief of the pathology branch of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute of the National Institutes of Health of Bethesda, Maryland. You'll notice tonight at dinner on your table was no salt, no butter, and no meat. And tonight, Dr. Roberts will discuss with us life, lipids, blood pressure, and longevity. Dr. Roberts. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Huckle, for those very kind comments. What I thought I would do would be to show a few pictures here at the beginning of how bad coronary artery disease really is. And number two, then to get into the cholesterol uh, uh, situation a bit. And finally, uh, uh, a few comments on hypertension. Now this is a coronary artery, and this, of course, is uh, uh, the arteries which supply blood to the heart muscle, which determines our fate. If you take a, a look at the person next to you, one of you is going to die from coronary disease. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's, that's how common it is. There are not many good things about coronary disease, of course. One of the better of those things is that it takes a great deal of narrowing in order to actually diminish flow uh, through a pipe, through a tube, through a coronary artery. Now here if we have a cross section of an artery and we divide it into four quadrants, four pies, one has to obliterate over three of those quadrants in order for flow to actually be diminished. In other words, if we have an artery narrowed such as this, that is, 70, that is 50 to, to 75 percent narrowing, there is no flow, no diminution of flow at all through this. So maybe our challenge is not necessarily the elimination of atherosclerosis, but simply the limiting of it uh, to less than 75 percent. Now, when I was in medical school, I was taught coronary atherosclerosis is a focal process. You see it in one artery, don't see it in another artery. See it in one spot in one artery, not in another spot. That's a dream. That may be the situation in the teens and the 20s, uh, but not, uh, not later. Now, atherosclerosis, unfortunately, as you well know, is not limited to a coronary artery. Here we have an aorta. The aorta is the superhighway of the vascular system. This aorta is a big tube, of course, and here it's been opened up. And look at the surface, the animal surface of that aorta. Every square millimeter is covered with atherosclerotic plaques. I've seen a lot of aortas like that. And that's a, if, you, if you take a slab of butter and leave it out for three days, that's what it looks like, about like that right there. <laughs> Now, I'm a cholesterol person. I think that cholesterol, if it itself is not the villain, it is the marker of the villain. Uh, so that, that's what we have to pay attention to. Now, these are the reasons, in my judgment, why, why, why the atherosclerotic uh, disease picture is linked to cholesterol. Dr. Roberts went on to trace the history of the cholesterol hypothesis, beginning with Nishkow, a Russian, who in 1912 fed a high-fat diet to rabbits and produced atherosclerotic plaques similar to those seen in humans. He also identified cholesterol as a component of these fatty materials. Biochemists subsequently identified cholesterol in human plaques. 
Following World War II, Ansel Keys demonstrated that atherosclerotic plaques large enough to produce clinical problems occurred only in persons who had total serum plasma cholesterol levels greater than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Dr. Roberts went on to point out that the 1980s have witnessed an explosion of scientific data confirming the link between atherosclerosis and cholesterol, and that the cholesterol puzzle is essentially now complete. A number of important studies, such as the LRC-CPPT trial using cholestyramine, the Helsinki trial using gemfibrozil, and the Mr. Fit trial, have demonstrated that the higher the total serum cholesterol level, the greater the chance of having symptomatic atherosclerotic disease, the greater the extent of atherosclerotic plaques, and the greater the chance of dying from atherosclerotic disease. The good news contained in these studies is that lowering the total serum cholesterol level decreases the chances of fatal or non-fatal atherosclerotic disease, and that atherosclerotic plaques regress when high cholesterol levels are lowered. Dr. Roberts concluded that in analyzing this data, it is now evident that for every 1% the total cholesterol rises, the increase in heart attack frequency is 2%. Conversely, if the total cholesterol falls by 1%, heart attack frequency drops by 2%. So in my judgment, any way one looks at it, cholesterol comes out as the villain. It's not a controversial subject anymore in my judgment, and I think the medical profession should get together and cut down this controversy uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Dr. Roberts continued his presentation on lipids on a personal note. If I had symptomatic myocardial ischemia, I'd want to be on a lipid-lowering drug. I would obviously want to be on a lipid-lowering diet, but I would want to be on a lipid-lowering drug right away. If I had coronary angioplasty, I would want to be on a lipid-lowering drug right away. If I had angina pectoris, I would want to be a lip on a lipid-lowering drug. If I had acute myocardial infarction and survived, I'd want to get my cholesterol level down, down, down it would pay. I would not, not want to be on a diet for six months or 12 months to see if I could get it down that way. I would do both at the same time. Now let me switch gears here a second to hypertension. Now, this is a picture of President Roosevelt, uh, for those of you who weren't born in 1945. But President Roosevelt died in April 45, and this picture was taken just a few days before his death. His blood pressure was 300 over 190. And the reason I show it is that there was no therapy for systemic hypertension. And look what the pharmaceutical industry has come up with in the last 40 years. Just uh, several, a lot of superb drugs to lower blood pressure. Uh, when he took office in March 1933, his blood pressure was 120 over 80. And you can see what the office did to him. And, uh, and he died in 1945. He had a CNS hemorrhage. That's a major tragedy of hypertension is a stroke. I can also tell you that Richard Nixon's blood pressure, when he took office in January 1969, was 110 over 70. And as you know, he left office under relatively undue circumstances in 1973. And when he left, his blood pressure was 110 over 70. <laughs> now you can conclude what you wish from that one. <laughs> the risk or seriousness of hypertension is proportional to the level. It's just like cholesterol. The higher the level, the greater the risk, and it's as simple as that. Elevated blood pressure, whether predominantly systolic or diastolic, labile or fixed, casually or basely elevated in either sex and at any age is a major contributor to the development of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. Note systolic, just as important as diastolic. So don't ignore that, that 170 over 85 in your patient. Uh, if the patient is 90 years of, old, of age, you might can ignore that, but, but be careful. Systolic uh, is indeed important. The Framingham group have taught us that. 
Uh, these are the, uh, most of the uh, uh, used drugs for treatment of systemic hypertension, and certainly in the states and uh, in this country as well. Diuretics, as you know, came out for congestive heart failure. It was noted after they came out for heart failure that blood pressure in these patients started going down. But uh, I worry about thiazides for hypertension. Clearly, thiazides raise the total cholesterol level. They raise the triglyceride level, and they raise the LDL level. The good thing about, tri about thiazides is the price. There is no question that they lower the um, uh, potassium level in the serum in many patients. I would stay away from thiazides. Now, beta blockers are obviously good drugs. Those without intrinsic sympathomimetic activity, like propranolol, atenolol, and many of them, um, do have effects on, on the uh, um, blood lipid levels. The triglyceride level goes up and the HDL uh, level uh, goes down. Those with intrinsic sympathomimetic activity, no effect on lipid levels. And those two, are, of course, are, are, uh, acetabulol and uh, pendolol. The sympatholytic drugs, these uh, uh, alpha types, uh, do indeed have uh, uh, good effects on the lipid levels. These are expensive drugs. The newer drugs, of course, the ACE inhibitors and the calcium antagonists, now they are neutral on the, on the lipids, uh, but they're expensive drugs, and they have no cardioprotective effect. Now, one of the things that I think all of us want to be sure we do is, is do no harm. And one of the things about thiazides is they do raise the, uh, uh, the uh, blood lipid levels a bit. And, and we've already shown this slide. For every 10%, the total cholesterol goes down. Heart attack frequency is decreased uh, uh, 20%. The reverse is also the case. If a total cholesterol goes up 10%, heart attack frequency increases 20%. All of the studies on thiazides as therapy for systemic hypertension have shown considerable drop in frequency of stroke and also aortic dissection, but no drop in frequency of symptomatic and fatal coronary disease. And maybe one of the reasons that that's the case is that they've had an adverse effect on blood lipids. Dr. Roberts emphasized his point that most antihypertensive medications used today alter total blood cholesterol levels. Now, there are some investigators that have thought the effect of thiazides on blood lipids were transient. That is, it, it uh, uh, returned to baseline in approximately one year. There was a recent study of 44 months comparing thiazides to atenolol. The, the, uh, the blood lipid levels in the thiazide diuretic stayed up the entire 44 months. Those in, with atenolol also went up for the entire 44 months, but of course not to the same degree as the thiazides. But I do think in the 1970s, at least in the States, that was a decade of hypertension. If your blood pressure was up, um, get it down. Know what it is, and if it's up, get it down. Now we're in the era of cholesterol. If it's up, get it down. I have a suspicion that the 1990s are going to be the era of regression of atherosclerotic plaques. It's known now, experimentally, that is in non-human animals, that that the lipid portion of a plaque is entirely reversible, entirely. Now, if we can take an artery that is narrowed over 75%, such as this, and take some of that lipid out of there, we can open up that artery to less than 75% narrowed in cross-sectional area. And flow through that area should be normal. I think, uh, at least in the, in the States, we say that the greatest risk factor to atherosclerosis is aging. Well, it doesn't have to be, just like hypertension. It doesn't have to be. These are coronary arteries in a woman who is 103 years of age. Now, these are sites of maximal narrowing. Look at that left main. My goodness, it's beautiful. Look at that right. That's the worst plaque she had. It is, look at that lumen, wide open. This is a left anterior descending, wide open. Mm. I trade with her right now. Uh, poor lady was run over by an automobile. <laughs> I think Mark Twain hit it on the head. The only way to keep healthy is to eat what you don't want, drink what you don't like, and do what you'd rather not. So it's <laughs> up to each one of us. Lights on. Thank you very much. May and Baker. 
the manufacturer of Sectrol and Nitrong SR, is pleased to have brought you these highlights from Dr. Roberts' presentation. Excerpts from a subsequent interview with Dr. Roberts will follow in one minute. We would like to thank Dr. Roberts for his interesting and provocative presentation. Let's rejoin Dr. Roberts as he answers a few specific questions. Dr. Roberts, what would be your treatment of choice for the patient with hypertension? Well, I think that uh, uh, the age of the patient, the race of the patient, uh, is, a, is a factor. Um, uh, price might be a factor. Um, I'm relatively anti-diuretics uh, myself. I think uh, diuretics are very useful in black people. Uh, in some black people, it's very difficult to control uh, uh, systemic hypertension without diuretics at times. In general, however, I favor a beta blocker. Uh, they are the least expensive. Uh, they're, they're more expensive than diuretics, but problems with diuretics are enormous. Uh, I think it's important to remember that diuretics came out uh, for a treatment of congestive heart failure. And systemic hypertension came later when it was found that in patients being treated for hypertension, their blood pressure uh, fell. Uh, but I think there are much better drugs today uh, for hypertension than diuretics. What about the use of diuretics in the older patient? Yeah, I think a lot of physicians use uh, diuretics uh, preferentially in older people. My, my view would be just the opposite. Uh, I'm, a, I'm more afraid of diuretics in older people than any other group. Dr. Roberts, can you compare the beta blockers with ISA? Well, there are essentially only two drugs with uh, ISA, which means, of course, intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. And the two beta blockers with that are acetabutalol and uh, pendolol. Pendolol has more in it than does acetabutalol, maybe too much in it actually. But neither of those uh, drugs have any um, adverse effect on blood lipids. No adverse effect on total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol. The ratio of HDL to total or HDL to LDL and no effect on triglycerides. And so that's a very favorable characteristic. Uh, acetabutalol has the four favorable um, uh, characteristics, uh, the four most favorable characteristics of beta blockers. Uh, uh, they, are, uh, they dissolve in water, uh, for example, and therefore uh, very little of that beta blocker, which uh, uh, has that characteristic, uh, does not cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, Acetabutalol, for example, is cardioselective, uh, which is an important feature uh, from the standpoint of side effects. Uh, propranolol, for example, is not cardioselective. Propranolol does not have uh, uh, ISA. Another favorable uh, feature of acetabutalol is that it's once a day. I mean, that's a wonderful characteristic of any drug. Dr. Roberts, when you have a patient whose blood pressure is well controlled on propranolol or atenolol, is it worth switching to another beta blocker? If one is treating an individual with propranolol for many years and the total cholesterol or, or the, the HDL is going down, the triglyceride continues uh, to go up, um, I don't think that person is, uh, is necessarily doing, the physician is not necessarily doing the patient a favor. When, it, when uh, another beta blocker could be substituted, 
one could get the same effect on blood pressure without any uh, adverse effect on blood lipids. If the beta blocker I am using doesn't affect total cholesterol, can there still be a problem? Oh, yeah. Uh, the problem there is that uh, many of the uh, beta blockers, um, as mentioned earlier, do not affect total cholesterol, but they, they lower the HDL cholesterol and they raise the triglyceride. It may be that those two go together. In, in most people, if you raise the triglycerides, uh, the effect on the HDL is opposite. The, uh, as the triglycerides go up, the high-density lipoproteins go down. And therefore, that total cholesterol HDL ratio, which is very important, uh, Framingham people have taught us that, it's very important, is altered, and it's altered in an unfavorable fashion. Should one consider adding lovastatin rather than changing beta blockers? No. Lovastatin is a wonderful drug, but lovastatin is not, uh, the purpose of lovastatin is not to counteract the elevation in blood lipids by a thiazide or a non-ISA beta blocker. Uh, that's a very expensive uh, drug, and it does have uh, some uh, 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 reaction, some side effects uh, that uh, uh, nobody wants to take a chance with it unless they have to. Dr. Roberts, is it really that necessary to consider the effect of your antihypertensive therapy on lipid levels? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's just bad uh, to give a drug to lower one's blood pressure if at the same time that drug raises uh, certain lipid levels like, uh, like um, uh, the total cholesterol or the low density lipoprotein. Uh, Thiazide uh, diuretics uh, raise the total cholesterol, they raise the uh, uh, low density lipoprotein uh, and they uh, decrease the uh, high density lipoprotein. Well that's very disadvantageous. Uh, the 30-year-old man with systemic hypertension who has his blood pressure lowered uh, with thiazides and if at the same time has the uh, total cholesterol and the LDL elevated, uh, that person um, has less chance of a stroke, but his chance of a heart attack is not diminished at all. Uh, there, there are plenty of drugs now that have no effect on uh, blood lipid levels. So why, with a, such a diverse variety to choose from, uh, why pick a drug uh, that adversely affects uh, uh, one's lipid levels? Dr. Roberts, is it really that important for me to be concerned about producing a small improvement in my patient's lipid levels? Well, I think the, uh, uh, a very important fact now for physicians and all people to remember is that it pays big dividends to lower cholesterol levels. And that is the total cholesterol, uh, the LDL cholesterol, and raise the HDL cholesterol. Uh, it's, it's important that the total cholesterol HDL ratio be maintained as good as possible. Uh, there is no question any longer that cholesterol is the villain in causing atherosclerosis. And to believe otherwise is to believe a myth and believe a dream. Uh, therefore, the lower one can get his or her uh, cholesterol levels, the bad ones, the better off that patient is. Uh, the more that those levels go up, uh, the greater the risk to that patient. Furthermore, when you're talking about a lot of people in a lot of populations, a rise of total cholesterol, let's say, of 5%, 4%, um, is very detrimental not only to that patient but as to the society as a group. And if you can lower uh, uh, a large number of people's cholesterol levels, three, four percent, you're making a huge impact on the health of that particular population. If I had a history of hypertension and just had a heart attack, what would be your drug of choice? Well, I would be very comfortable with acetabutalol. I don't want to give anybody a drug that, that uh, particularly in somebody who's had a coronary event. I mean, you would have not had a heart attack if your total cholesterol had been totally normal or if your uh, HDL was not too low, et cetera. 
So I would not want to give you a drug that would, um, would alter your lipids uh, adversely. I'd, I'd be very comfortable with acetabutalol. My mother's on acetabutalol. We would like to thank Dr. Roberts for his interesting comments. This program was brought to you by May and Baker, manufacturer of Sectrol and Nitrong SR.